Well, welcome to this webinar on preparing our kids to confront lies within their hearts. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Elizabeth Urbanowitz and I run Foundation Worldview, which is a ministry that is designed to equip Christian adults with the tools that they need to prepare our children to carefully evaluate every idea they encounter. And now those of you who have followed the Foundation Worldview ministry for a while, you know that we spend a lot of time in our ministry focusing on the influence that culture has on our children and how can we prepare our children to biblically navigate all that is coming their way in the culture. However, we know as believers that lies not only stem from the culture, but they also stem from within our own fallen hearts and minds that we know that we have inherited Adam's sin and therefore we are fallen image bearers and Satan, the enemy of our souls would like nothing better than for us to believe these lies that stir up in our own fallen nature. You know, I saw this very, very clearly when I was growing up that one of the sins I really struggled with consistently when I was growing up was the sin of self pity. When things wouldn't go my way, you know, rather than having a grateful heart and just bouncing back, I would sink into self pity and just think, Oh, poor me. And sadly in that self pity, one of the things that I would do is I would try to make everyone in my family or whoever else was around me feel just as miserable as I was feeling. And now as I grew into a teen, I knew that this was a sin and I knew that it was something that I was not supposed to give into, but it just felt like this monster that kept rising up that I had very little control over. And it wasn't until in my early twenties, God was very gracious in putting me in situations where I realized that I was believing a lie, that I was believing the lie consistently that I deserved better than what I had been given. And that the antidote for that was remembering that God had called me to give thanks in all circumstances, because I could trust that God was working all things together for my good by using all things to conform me into the image of his son. And it wasn't until I identified that lie that I was believing and replaced it with the truth from God's word that I was able to start to have victory over this consistent sin pattern in my life. And so those of you who are working with children who have children of your own or foster children or nieces, nephews, if you're in a Christian education setting or a church setting, you know that the children that we're working with, they're fallen just like us. And they have different lies that arise in their heart that lead into some can lead into some very serious sin patterns. So today we're going to dive down deep into how can we prepare our kids to confront these lies that are going to arise in their own hearts and minds and prepare them to stand firmly on the word of God. Now I'm very excited um, for the guest that I have with us today to help me talk about this is author Sarah Malley Hancock. So please welcome Sarah. Um, Sarah, thank Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so grateful to have you on. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, for those of you who follow the Foundation Worldview Book Club, you know that each month we recommend three titles, one for adults, one for kids 8 to 12, and one for kids 4 to 7, and then give some corresponding worldview questions. And this month we see featured Sarah's book, Speak Truth in Your Heart in our eight to 12 year old range. So if you're not familiar with this book, this is an excellent resource and it's gonna be the perfect follow-up to the teaching in this webinar. So highly recommend that you check out a copy of Speak Truth in Your Heart and get it and read it through the children that God has placed in your care. Now, Sarah, I'm I'm really excited for so many questions to ask you <laughs> in this <laughs> webinar. But the first one um, that I think is really important for us to think through is, you know, so often, Um, for Christian parents, we focus on correcting our child's behavior, on correcting their actions. And now, obviously, Christian parents need to train their children to live rightly. You know, that's a huge part of raising kids. But in your book, you highlight how focusing solely on behavior can lead to failure. And can you explain to us a little bit, why is it that if we solely focus on correcting behavior, that's ultimately going to lead to failure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to start. Just the realization that wrong actions come from wrong thinking. And Mm -hmm. I think your story you just told is an example of that. You know, those wrong actions really could be traced back to the lie that you believe that you deserve something better. And I think in many of our lives, when we're struggling with something, you know, sometimes we're struggling with it and then we start doing a little bit better. And then pretty soon the problem comes back and we're struggling with the same thing again and we work on it, but we're just kind of addressing the the surface actions. 
And then the mm -hmm. next thing we know, we're studying, struggling with exactly the same thing again. And I think that often happens when we just focus on the actions and we're not getting deeper to, okay, what's the wrong thinking behind this action? You know, we're just focusing on the symptoms and we're not really thinking, okay, what is the root problem here? <laughs> and, you know, the right. same thing applies with our children. Like we, we don't want just outward, good outward behavior. We really want them to love the Lord with all of their heart. And so if we just focus on, you know, basically the outward actions are an indication of a deeper problem. They're an indication of a heart problem. And that can help us to know what to address and how to address that. And it says in Romans 12 too, it says, do not be conformed to, be th to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so that's mm -hmm. what we want to help our children to do is to align their thinking with God's thinking. And realizing that those wrong actions can help show them where their wrong thinking might be, where it might not be aligned with the word of God. And mm -hmm. it kind of makes me think of like, if you walk into the kitchen and your white floor is covered with like muddy footprints <laughs> and then you get out your mop and you get it all cleaned up. Um, and then the next thing you know, here comes your little dog and he runs and he's running in the house. And you notice that right outside the door, there's like a big pile of mud. And he runs through the mud and then he runs through the kitchen and you've got these muddy footprints again and you get out the mop and you clean it again. It's all nice and white and sparkling. And then, you know, dad comes home from work and he walks through the mud pile, walks through the house. There's these muddy footprints again. Like you're going to just be washing. You're going to be cleaning the floor over and over <laughs> unless you like get rid of the mud right outside the door, you know, and how sometimes that's what we do in our life. We just keep getting out the mop and cleaning up the messes rather than really identifying, okay, what's the root problem here and how can I address that? Yes. Oh, I love that. I love that, that picture that you've just given us of <laughs> the muddy kitchen floor, you know, with the mud puddle outside. Uh -huh. And then what we're doing is just mopping up the floor rather than mm -hmm. actually, you know, going and taking care of the mud puddle problem outside. Right. I think that's such a good word picture. Now, for those of you who are watching right now and thinking of you know your own interactions with the children that God has placed in your sphere of influence. I think what Sarah said is so key that so often, you know, we just focus on the behavior, you know, like my child is having a temper tantrum. They shouldn't have temper tantrums, you know, or my child is having a bad attitude here, or my child just hit his sibling here. And we're focusing so much on the action where we're not diving down deep into the problem. Because I mean, think about, you know, I, I know I don't have children of my own, but my siblings do, you know, I've worked with a lot of children through a decade of teaching. And I know that, you know, those problems, like you said, Sarah, they just keep coming back over and over and over again. You know, usually a child doesn't just hit their sibling once, you know, usually it comes back again and again. Now, so for those of you watching, what we're talking about is obviously going to involve a lot of time. What Sarah said, you know, actually getting down to the root of this. But I hope that as you know, as you're watching and you're listening, you can be praying through, okay, what things, Lord, you know, might I need to cut out here or there so that I actually have time to focus on this with these children that God has placed in our care? Because if we, you know, if our children leave our home and they, they're these perfectly, you know, like white sparkling floors, but there's still the mud puddle outside, you know, the mud is going to get tracked in again. I love that example, Sarah. So thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So now you, you talk, you, in that illustration, you compared, you know, like the mud puddle to, to the lies that we're believing, you know, the root of mm -hmm. the problem. And so mm -hmm. can you just kind of walk us through like, like what happens when we and our children dwell on lies, you know, like when we're mm -hmm. kind of standing there in the mud puddle and we're dwelling on lies, what, what's actually happening, you know, like inside our hearts and our minds and then, then our actions. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think. If we tell ourselves something enough times, we will start to believe it. And so what starts as just a little wrong thought soon can turn into this deeply rooted lie. And, you know, if we think to ourselves like, well, I'm not really doing anything wrong. I'm just thinking something wrong. It's not going to really make a difference. Then we really are clueless, I think, of how the enemy mm. works and just of how much we are impacted by what we think about. And it reminds me of a call, a phone call I had once with a younger girl. She was about 15. And she said that she had a question she wanted to ask me. And she seemed um, kind of nervous to ask her question. But then she finally just said, well, Sarah, she said, like, how do I know if God loves me? 
And I said, oh, that's such a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Yeah. And I, said, well, I said, well, think of the, the children's song. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And I said, we can know God loves us because of his word. And she said, but if God loves me, then why do bad things happen to me? And why was that? Why won't God just do a little miracle, you know, to show me that he loves me? And I said, well, what is the greatest miracle that God already did for you to show you his love? And she was quiet for a minute. And then she said, well, he sent Jesus to die for me. And I said, yes, he sent Jesus to die for you. God commended his love for us in this. Well, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And, and I said, there's no greater miracle God could possibly do to show you his love for you. And she said, but I just wish I could know for sure. And I said, well, you can know for sure. I said, you know, some people ask me a question and I can't give them a definitive answer in their situation, but I can tell you from God's word about God's love for you. And I even opened up my Bible and read from Romans eight, just the whole section about how nothing can separate us from God's love. But it was really sad because at the end of the phone call, she just, she wasn't convinced. It's like, she still had all these questions in her mind. Like, why does, why do these, why do these things happen to me? Why isn't God showing me his love? And it really seemed like in her situation, whenever something in life had gone differently than she thought it should, whenever she faced a trial, she would just allow this thought, maybe God doesn't love me. If God loved me, this wouldn't be happening. And how this had just become really like a deeply rooted lie in her heart. And right. I mean, that just is kind of a reminder to all of us that we need to take these wrong thoughts seriously. Like our mind is a battlefield. And if we belong to Jesus, if we're a Christian, then this is his territory. But the enemy, he wants to attack. And, and Satan is a liar. He is deceptive. I mean, we see that from Genesis 1, from Genesis 3, you know, right. we see his, his lies. And we see that all the way in Re- Revelation 12. He's called the deceiver of the whole world. And so we just see like lies, deceit, that's his tool against us. And, and even after we become believers, I think sometimes we don't realize that that's his primary tool against us is deception. And um, so, you know, if this is our mind and he attacks with wrong thoughts, if we just allow that wrong thought to stay and take place in our mind and to just dwell there, it's just going to, it's going to get worse and worse. It's going to start permeating all of our thinking. And so we need to just evaluate, is that, is this thought true or not? Because some of Satan's lies are very tricky, <laughs> you know, right. they're it's a little bit of lie and a little bit of truth. And we need to just, to just take everything to God's word and discern, is this true? Is this consistent with God's word? And if not, we can't let that mind, that thought stay in our mind. If it does, you know, it's going to just stir up trouble. Um, but then I think the key is you can't just like, push wrong thoughts out of your mind because that's not really how it works. That'd be kind of like waking up in the morning and just like trying to push all the darkness out of your room. What you do in the morning is Hmm. you turn on the light, you know? And so I think that the more we just fill our mind with God's word, then the more there is no place for the lie and we're able to more quickly see those lies and evaluate them. Yes. Oh, so many good things that you said there that I want to pull out two things that are that I'd like to camp out on. Um, and so first, for those of you listening, I think that's so important what Sarah was saying there is about recognizing those lies right when they start, that the more we dwell on a lie, the deeper, the more ingrained it's going to be. So this is something I think we can start even with really little ones, even with really little ones, even when we're talking about three or four year olds, and you can do the same thing with a 13 or 14 year old, just use a different tone of voice. As you know, (laughs) you're going to want to use a different tone of voice with them. But even with a three or four year old, you know, if, if they push their sibling, you can ask them, you know, not in the heat of the moment, but after things have calmed down, say, what, what did you do? You know, I, I pushed, you know, so and so. Why did you do that? You know, and maybe they say, like, you know, they he took my toy, you know, or he made me mad. And then say, okay, let's think about what lie you were believing. You know, now with a three or four year old, we're going to have to help them identify that. They're not going to be able to identify that on their own. But if we can help them identify that, this is going to start a pattern in their life, even from a young age, that whenever they start to do something or they do something that they know does not align with God's word, they can ask themselves, okay, what lie am I believing? You know, so with a three year old, you could even ask, okay, what lie were you believing? you were believing that you were the most important and that your feelings were pointing you to truth. Okay. And then you can point them back to God's 
word, you know, talking about that we are to worship the Lord and serve him only, that he is the one that is most important, you know, and then that our heart is wicked and deceitful above all things so that we're not supposed to follow our feelings. For those of you who have used foundation, early childhood worldview curriculum, you know, we talk about the difference between truth. We have kids raised their arms for truth and then feelings that we're supposed to follow truth not our feelings. So love, love what you've said, what you said there, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that you were talking about, um, you were talking about, you know, like replacing those lies with something else. And I, I, I was just smiling so big <laughs> when you said that, <laughs> because that is just the example that the apostle Paul continually gives us in his epistles in the new Testament. He tells us what to take off but then after that, immediately after he tells us what to put on, and that is the continual pattern in the New Testament, take off these things that belong to our flesh and put on these things that are of the spirit. So just, so just really, Sarah, thank you so much for the clarity mm -hmm. that you're bringing to this topic. Just love that there. Now, the title of your book is to speak truth in your heart. And you've kind of touched on that a little bit, you know, that we have mm -hmm. to identify these lies. And then we need to replace them with the truth. But can you just explain to us a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by speak truth in your heart? You know, why did you choose this as the title of your book? Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, that actually comes from Psalm 15, verses one and two, that says, Lord, who may abide in your tab tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. So that's where that phrase comes from. And really the idea of like telling ourselves the truth or reminding ourselves, you know, it's one thing to know the truth, but to remind ourselves of that truth, to not just have it in our mind, but in our heart to believe that truth. And I think just to counsel in our heart in the truth, you know, because many times we, we may know the truth, but we're starting to dwell on lies. Like I remember one time I was just taking a short little walk and I was feeling kind of discouraged at um, at that time about singleness. So I was in my upper twenties. I was single, just had that desire for marriage and was disappointed by a couple possibilities that hadn't worked out. And so I was just walking along there and I had this thought, I'm never going to get married. Well, then I stopped myself and I thought, you know, that's not really what I should be thinking because that's not really the truth. Cause the truth is, I don't know if I'm going to get married. I might feel like I never am, but I don't know. But the truth is, that the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Psalm 138 verse eight. And the truth is that if God can call the stars into existence, it's not a hard thing for him to bring me a godly husband if it's his will for <laughs> me to get married. You know, so I should be dwelling on the truth in this situation. And I started to realize how much my whole attitude and emotions were impacted by what I was thinking about. You know, like if I was going throughout the day and just thinking whether it was about singleness, like I'm never going to get married or whether it was just about circumstances, like this is never going to get any better or about friendships. This person doesn't even, you know, care about me or notice what I'm doing. Just those kinds of thoughts, like whether they're direct lies or whether they're more just like, you know, thoughts that are discouraging or thoughts that are based on fear instead of faith, you know, kind of like that thought I'm never going to get married. Well, that was really a thought that came from fear rather than a thought that came from faith, you know? And so when I think all those things, it just kind of sets this tone for like being discouraged, focusing on myself and it starts affecting my emotions, my attitudes, my words, pretty soon my actions, <laughs> my whole life. But then on the mm -hmm. other hand, if, if I just choose to speak the truth to myself, you know, Jesus is on the throne today. Kind of like uh, yours, I can give thanks in everything that you were saying was one that you were focusing on or just, you know, my citizenship is in heaven and he, my hope is, is in heaven. Just those kinds of reminders of truth. I can get done today everything God wants me to get done by his strength. You know, focusing on the truth, that just sets my whole, like the whole tone for the day and begins to affect my emotions and my attitudes and my actions and eventually my life. <laughs> so it just kind of clicked for me, I right. think, on that particular day, how, wow, what I'm thinking about really just impacts my whole life, right? So no wonder the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. What you're, we're thinking about affects every area of our life. And I, I think I kind of realized like the battle is going on right now in my mind. And if I don't win the battle in my mind, 
then it's going to pretty soon be affecting my actions. And I remember kind of having the picture in my mind of Ephesians 6, 16, where it says, above all, take the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. And I thought, you know, those lies and those discouraging thoughts, they're like fiery darts from the enemy. But I can just hold up my shield of faith, just quote the word of God. And that's the speaking truth in my heart, you know, and just kind of imagine those fi fiery darts just falling to, falling to the ground. Um, and so just, it just really started to click with me, like, no wonder God says so much about meditation on scripture, because that's what meditation on scripture is. It's speaking the truth in our heart. It's being, reminding ourselves of what God's word says, like in Psalm 1, where it says, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord, in his law, he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the streams of water that brings forth fruit in season and whatever he does will prosper. It's like, wow, that's an amazing promise for the person who meditates on God's word. And it just all kind of started to make sense to me. No wonder it says that because when we meditate on God's word, what we think about really does affect every area of our life. And so that has been very powerful in my life and something that's very encouraging for me to be able to share with others too. Yes. Well, that makes complete sense then why you chose that as the title. <laughs> yes. Of your book. And as you were talking about that, you know, just describing the process of, you know, hearing these lies that we're, that we're speaking to ourselves, and then replacing them with God's word, you know, taking up the shield of faith, meditating on God's word. I was thinking how much that really mirrors um, Christ as our second Adam, you know, that, that Romans talks about, you know, how an Adam all die, but in Christ all live. And, you know, like the first Adam, he, you know, he and Eve, they, they heard the lies of the serpent, you know, did God really say you cannot mm -hmm. eat from any tree in the garden? And mm -hmm. what did Eve do? She entertained that lie. And rather than speaking the truth, she just started talking with the serpent. And then they decided mm -hmm. that they knew better than, you know, what God's word had said, what he had spoken mm -hmm. directly to them. And they believed that lie, you know, and we're still living with the repercussions of that today. Mm -hmm. But then Christ, the second Adam, you know, who came as our representative, he's in the wilderness and he's tempted in these incredible ways by Satan, you know, and he's, you know, weak physically because of fasting for 40 days. And what does he do? He responds with the truth of God's word and how that's what we want to prepare our children to do. We want mm -hmm. to prepare them to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the second Adam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> redeem us. So love that, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, as you know, as you have, have written this book and have interacted, I know um, your ministry, your Bright Lights ministry, that's mainly focused on uh, young or girls in their, you know, that are in their adolescence. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. The focus is kind of girls 10 to 13, Okay, but we'd have a lot for all, for all young women. Okay. So, so as you've worked with the next generation, I know some uh, listening right now, they had the, you know, they work with young men who also face lies <laughs> as well. As you've worked with the next generation, what are some, are, or are there any patterns in the lies that you see the next generation believing right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it starts with what you were just sharing about thinking about Satan in the garden and what were the lies he was telling Eve? He was really tempting Eve to basically doubt God's word and basically doubt God's character. You know, has God said, and you'll not surely die, you know, kind of getting Eve to believe that God didn't really have her best intentions in mind, that doubting what God said and doubting that God was really doing what was best for her. And so I think that almost all of the other lies really spring from a right understanding of who God is. And so there's so many young people and they don't even realize that they're believing, you know, I can't really trust God or God doesn't really love me or God doesn't really know what I'm going through. But um, I think then that when we don't have a, a proper understanding of who God is, then we also don't have a proper understanding of who we are. And when I started writing my book, Speak Truth in Your Heart, I wrote to all the bright lights leaders around the country and just said, Hey, I'm writing this book. Do any of you have any testimonies or stories from your own life about a lie that you believed and how the Lord has helped you to overcome that lie that you could share with me, you know, that I could use as an illustration in my book. And so I started getting a lot of just emails of these testimonies. And I, then I started categorizing them. So I had like, okay, wrong thoughts about God, wrong thoughts about ourselves 
wrong thoughts about emotions, wrong thoughts about sin and temptations and purity and relationships and trials and just all these different categories. And as I was doing that, I realized, wow, there's one category that's really like three times bigger than all the others. And it was wrong thoughts about myself. And so I've seen that that is a very common struggle, especially with young women, is just lies like, I am worthless. I am ugly. And it may not be necessarily the most common lies, but I think it's the most common that they're aware of, you know, because those mm -hmm. lies just really trouble them and and really like bring a lot of discouragement to their lives. And I think those lies are also so confusing because the world is bringing different answers than God's word is bringing. The world says things like, well, just be awesome or you're awesome just like you are. Just be you. Find your inner goodness and basically like look into yourself to feel good about yourself. And while that might sound good, it doesn't bring the answer to the problem, because when we look into ourselves, we all find that we are inadequate and that we're sinners and that we do fail. And so the hope comes from not who we are in ourselves, but who we are in Jesus, like who we are in Christ and understanding who he is and that we have a new identity in him. And but I do think all of the just the, the things that we hear from the world and then the thoughts that girls are dealing with in their own hearts can create a lot of confusion. So I think that's a common one. And then that kind of along with that one, one that we're hearing from the world all the time right now is like, I can choose my own identity. You know, I can be who I want to be. I should be whatever will make me most happy. Um, you know, so that's a big one. And then pretty much every area of life, you know, emotion. Right. <laughs> I can, I cannot control my emotions. <laughs> that's a common one. Or sin. One little sin isn't really going to matter. I mean, we might not think of it in that term, but that's basically what we're believing. Like I can do this and it's not going to be a big deal. And that's just such a, a lie from the enemy. So many young people get started you know, compromised, not knowing where it was going to take them. Um, so pretty much every area of life, like and the right. enemy is attacking with lies. Right. You've identified some really big ones there. And I really appreciate how you started off, you know, explaining how you categorize them. Um, <laughs> but then also pointing out that a lot of times the lies can fall into the category of either an incorrect understanding of who God is or an incorrect understanding of who we are. Because, you know, so much stems from that, you know, if you're talking about right. lies about emotions, you know, that, that comes from, you know, both an incorrect understanding of who we are and our responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to submit our emotions before the Lord and to walk in truth, you know, or an un incorrect understanding of who God is and how mm -hmm. he has created us. And so I think for those of you who are watching, those are two really big areas in which we need to make sure that we're grounding our children in the truth, that we're grounding them in a true, accurate understanding of who God is that's based in his word, as well as a true, accurate understanding of who we are, again, that's based in his word. Now, I'm sure there are some of you who are watching and are listening and you're thinking, okay, this is, this is all sounds well and good, you know, but my, the child or children I'm working with, they're not even convinced yet that scripture is true. And so obviously that would present a huge problem because we have to believe that the word of God is the word of God. If we, you know, like are going to ground ourselves in it and be transformed by that. So if you're in a position where the kids in your care are just thinking like, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, just, just a resource that I highly recommend that we recommended in our book club before is the book cold case Christianity for kids. Um, if you're working with kids over the age of 12, you can just get the adult version cold case Christianity. But the author, Jay Warner Wallace, just dives down deep into the Gospels and he gives he's a cold case homicide detective in L.A. And he gives all of the same um, I'm losing my words here. He, he goes through the whole process that he would go through to determine if an eyewitness is reliable. And he applies that to the New Testament Gospels, showing that over and over and over and over and over again, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are reliable eyewitnesses that this is actually true. This is God's word. We can trust it. So if you have kids in that place, just highly recommend that you check that out. Um, also, just as a reminder, we're going to in about five minutes, we're going to wrap up this discussion and we're going to transition into a time of questions. So if you have a question, that you would like for us to answer, make sure you put it in the questions tab, not in the general chat, but in the questions tab. Um, Sarah, this has been so helpful and it's just even been such a good and helpful refresher for me and just how important it is for me, you know, even to identify the lies that I'm believing and to ground myself in the truth of God's word. But I was wondering if before we move into our time of questions, can you just model for us, you know, how you would help someone identify 
a lie they're believing and replace mm-hmm. it with the truth. You know, this can be like a, you know, a testimony that you, that you have got written into your ministry or just, you know, just as an sure. example of how you would do this with someone. Yeah. Well, I think there's two main ways that we find lies that we're believing. And the first one is just knowing the truth. Like you were just talking <laughs> about like God's word, because when we know God's truth, we will more quickly identify lies. But then the second way I think is evaluating the fruit in our life. You know, we see an area where, okay, there's a problem here. There's something not right. There's something I'm struggling with. This can help me identify, okay, maybe what is a lie that I'm believing. Uh, So from my own life, one lie that I think I struggled with believing, and I can kind of see this in different seasons of my life, in different seasons, I had different struggles, but sometimes they can point to a similar lie that you're believing. So one of those areas for me is I remember when I was 13, I remember just thinking, I really want a friend. You know, I had lots of friends, but I'm looking for one close, good friend. And just this frustration that like there was something I needed that I didn't have. Well, then in my 20s and 30s, there was a friendship that I had that was bringing some disappointment to me. I felt like, okay, she's not really being there for me when I need her. And just kind of this disappointment, this kind of feeling of hurt in a friendship. Um, in that time I was single, I, like I said, I was struggled with, you know, those thoughts about singleness when I was in my twenties and I actually didn't get married till I was 41. So God gave me many years as a single woman and some, and I love those years. They were wonderful, but you know, in the hard times, sometimes a thought that I would have is just, I need a husband to talk to about this right now. Well, then my husband, Andrew, when he and I were in a relationship, getting to know each other, it was a really wonderful time, but it had some trials too. He's had chronic back pain for many years and he had a really bad flare up, right? As we were just really, God is really bringing us together. And he ended up needing to step away from his pastoral position. And it just kind of slowed down our relationship. And, and I remember kind of having this thought like, okay, we just need to move forward. Like it's too hard just being in this waiting period. And so, okay, four different times needing a friend when I'm 13, feeling hurt in a friendship, feeling like I need a husband, feeling like we need to move forward. But all of them have some something similar. In all of them, I'm looking for a person to meet a need for me. I'm feeling like there's a level of intimacy that I need that I don't have. So I think a lie that I was tempted to believe in every one of those situations was Jesus is not enough to satisfy me right now. I mean, of course, I wasn't saying that. I wasn't saying Jesus is not enough. Mm-hmm, right. But it's, in essence, it was like what I was believing in those moments when I was like, I need, I must have this. And, and so then, you know, when we find that lie we're believing, then, of course, we want to just replace it with truth. And one verse I really love is Psalm 107, verse 9. It says, he, the Lord, satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry with good things. And it acknowledges that our soul might be longing, our soul might be hungry. Like it doesn't mean that there's not longings and there's not hunger and that's not wrong. But in the midst of that, there's like a deeper satisfaction available to us in Jesus all the time. And and that's where I needed to run to and cling to that truth that Jesus can satisfy me right now in this situation and then build my thinking on that truth. You know, so I'm needing a friend. Well, the truth is Jesus knows what I need even better than I do. And I can trust him. Um, I'm feeling like I need a husband. Well, the truth is Jesus is the lover of my soul more than anyone else. And so just building my thinking on that truth. And so I think just some like diagnostic questions that can help us, you know, when we're trying to trying to dig deep and find what is a lie I'm believing would be, first of all, looking at our actions, like, okay, what's a struggle that I'm having? And then second, looking at our thinking, like, okay, well, what's troubling me right now? You know, what's what's bothering me? What's on my mind? Um, And then thirdly would be looking at our heart. Okay, what am I looking to to satisfy me right now? What am I looking to for satisfaction? And then fourth, what's my hope? What am I trusting in right now? I think those four questions can help. Just what struggle am I having? What's troubling me? What am I looking to for satisfaction? And what am I trusting in? And then just asking the Lord to help us find, okay, what are some things I might be believing that are not true? And what's your truth in your word? that I can replace the lie with. Oh, that's so helpful. Sarah, can you say those four things one more time? Just, I'm sure there's some people that were trying to frantically write them down. So can you say them one more time? (laughs) Yes. Number one, what struggle am I having? So we're looking at our actions there. Okay. Two, what is troubling me? Looking at my thinking. Mm -hmm. Three, 
what am I looking to, to satisfy me? You know, where's my heart? Mm -hmm. And then, or what am I trusting in? Where's my mm -hmm. hope right now? Oh, such great question, Sarah. Thank you so much. And thank you for that very clear example. I really appreciate how you showed those four very distinct situations, but that all had a common thread that you were able mm -hmm. to identify the lie that you were believing, you know, where you were looking to for your satisfaction and the truth that you needed to replace it with. So I think for all of us, you know, who have been listening to Sarah share this information with us, I think this is a challenge for us. You know, this webinar is focused on how we can equip our children to do this. But the fact of the matter is we cannot equip our children to do something that we ourselves have not been equipped to do. And so I'm sure that in many ways, you know, we're, we as adults are believing lies. And this is going to be a continual process of sanctification, you know, until Jesus calls us home of identifying these lies in our hearts. And then the truth that sets us free from those lies. But that's what I would encourage everyone who's watching, you know, to after this webinar, spend some time, you know, just looking at the, over at those four questions and thinking through, okay, what are some situations in my life recently where I know that I've sinned? I know I have not been obedient to God in this situation. And then asking ourselves those four questions so that we can really identify the root of the issue and then put into practice, putting on the truth of God's word. Because once we've made a habit of doing that, that's when we can really help our children do those things. So those four questions that Sarah just gave us, um, and if you still haven't written them down, you will be sent a recording of this webinar. So in a few days, you'll get a recording. You can go back, you can watch it. You can write it down as slowly as you need to. But if we could even have just those four questions on a card, you know, or even somewhere hung up in our home, that when a discipline situation comes up, not in the heat of the moment, but later, you know, after we've implemented a consequence, when we talk with our children through what just happened and what was revealed in their hearts through their action, if we can walk them through those four questions and just create this pattern in their life so that they're always thinking through those questions and trying to identify what is the lie that they're believing, they're going to be on the trajectory for walking in the truth, for consistently speaking the truth in their heart. Now, those of you who are working with older children, um, you know, if, if you're implementing this with a three or four year old, well, it might be hard to get them to verbally articulate the answers to those questions. And you're going to have to do a little bit of help there. You can actually establish this pattern early on, where if you're working with a child 10 on up, starting to establish this pattern is going to be difficult. You might even get an eye roll, which again, you then have to address, you know, because that's not the appropriate response. But you can even ask those questions there with that and push through that difficulty because it's so important that we want our children to speak truth in their hearts. Now, we're going to transition into our time of questions. But before we do that, Sarah, is there anything else that you wanted to share with us um, or anything you wanted to add to what you've already said before we move on into this time? I would just say, I think that John 8, 31 and 32 is a great verse to remember that says, if we abide, Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And mm. I think for me, the reason I'm passionate about this topic is because whatever struggle I'm going through and every season has its, its different struggles, this is always the answer for me. I need to remind myself, okay, what's the truth right now? And that's what I need to dwell on. And the truth is what will make us free. Yes. Amen. Great passage of scripture to focus on with our kids. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. We're going to transition into our time of questions. So we'll try to get to as many as we can during this time. If we happen to have too many questions to answer, um, I will do my best to answer them on a future Foundation Worldview podcast. <laughs> so that's what we'll do with any extras. So our first question says, how would you recommend immersing our children in scripture so that they know the truth? I think that's a great question. So Sarah, would you like to start us off? You know, how would you recommend for parents to actually immerse their kids in scripture so that they know the truth? Right. Wow. That's a great question. And it starts as, as soon as they're born. In our family, Bible memorizing was very important and something that like when I just look back on my parents and their parenting and think, what am I so grateful that my parents did? <laughs> a huge thing is that they really emphasize scripture memorization. Mm. And we did that in different ways, but we were part of a program called Bible quizzing. But there's many there's many different you know tools and ministries to help you. But just they really made it a priority. And I remember, you know, some days so I was started homeschooling when I was 11. 
So once we started homeschooling, some days it's like, okay, we can't get everything in today. Is it going to be math or is it going to be Bible? It's like my parents would emphasize the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so just like that emphasis on Bible memorization. And I think, of course, reading the Bible as a family and of course, all the, the things that, you know, the more ways that we can implement it and saturate our children with it is so important, but also encouraging them to start reading on their own. And I'm really grateful for, I was in a Christian school and a Christian school teacher that really encouraged me, you know, it's not enough to just read the Bible at school mm -hmm. or at home with your family. You need to read the Bible yourself. So that wasn't something that anyone ever like made me do. You know, it was more that they encouraged me to make my own decision to just start reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. And obviously reading the Bible will change our lives. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for that too. Yes. Oh, that's su such great advice. Yes. Highly recommend everything that Sarah said. <laughs> you, were, you know, scripture memory with our children, making sure that we are having a daily time of Bible reading as a family. You know, usually after dinner, it's the easiest there, but you can start, you know, first thing in the morning when your kids wake up. And then what Sarah said also, um, those of you who have followed Foundation Worldview for a while, you know that we are passionate about equipping children to soundly read, interpret, and apply scripture on their own because we want to make sure that our children are self-feeders, <laughs> that they know how to feast on God's word and understand what it says. And if you're thinking that's great, but you know, like I, I don't, I'm not even sure that I know how to read God's word that well. Um, actually just, I think it was two months ago, we ran another webinar called teaching our kids how to read the Bible. So if you check out that webinar, we just give some really practical hands-on tools that you can begin implementing tomorrow with your children in equipping them to soundly read, interpret, and apply scripture on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next question um, says, thank you so much for this wise and beautiful book. So that's for you, Sarah. <laughs> um, yeah. I have three boys and would love the same material geared for them. Do you recommend adjusting the scenarios and stories in the book for boys? Well, since you're the author, Sarah, I will, um, I'll let you go first with that. <laughs> Yes, definitely. I don't know of a, another book for boys that's quite, you know, the same, but absolutely, you know, we have so many of the same struggles. And if you come apart, you know, come to a, a part that seems more to affect, you know, more to be relevant to women, it's good for guys to have an idea of the things girls struggle with. Maybe they have sisters, maybe they're going to have a wife someday. And, and so it's okay to say, you know, this is something to be aware of that your sisters in Christ might struggle with. And it's helpful. Um, in that, in that way too. But yes, I mean, nearly all of it's going to be very applicable to guys as well. Like just yes. truths about who God is, you know, those truths that, that are those solid ones about the gospel and who we are, you know, who we are in Christ. I mean, it makes no difference, male or female, um, all those yes. basic truths. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Definitely. The truths about God do not change whether we are male or female. Um, mm -hmm. The truths about God stay the same. And yes, mm -hmm. as Sarah said, you know, going through even, you know, if you're just going through this with boys, having them understand some of the lies that girls typically struggle with can be a really great thing. Then two other things that I would recommend, you know, it's generally in most things, a great idea for us to go through what we're going to go through with our children ahead of time so that we're not surprised and we're prepared for the things we're going to talk about with them. So to go through this book with your sons, just recommend, you know, if you're going to go through a chapter a week or, you know, two chapters a week, just make sure that you read them ahead of time. You can take some notes in the margin. Um, I think this, this question was submitted by a woman. So you can ask your husband or, you know, if your husband if, or if your children's father is not in their life right now, you know, you can ask another godly um, brother in Christ in the church, you know, what are some lies that men might struggle with. You can actually even ask your boys this, you know, say this example is one that probably usually it's girls that struggle with it. Guys might struggle with it as well, but what are some of the lies that you think that guys believe about their emotions? And that can be a great conversation starter. So highly recommend that you get this book, whether you have just girls, just boys, or a mixture of the two. Um, very, very helpful. Um, so that is, I think that we are, uh, we're done with our questions. So we didn't have a whole ton of questions today, but I know we gave a lot of really important information. So people were just thinking really deeply about that. Um, but just Sarah, where can people find out more about um, the Bright Lights ministry that you run and then the information? We'll go. Um, sorry, I think my microphone just cut out for a second. I, I hit it accidentally. <laughs> Um, where can people go to find out more information about your ministry and your books? Yes. 
So our, our website is brightlightsministry.com. And there's all the information there, how to start a Bright Lights group. We have a conference coming up on um, online conference about mentoring younger women. That's kind of for older girls and moms for mentoring younger women, women. And our books available there and lots of other resources are available there also. So that's brightlightsministry.com. And my name is Sarah Hancock. So if you have trouble finding it, just <laughs> Bright Lights, Sarah Hancock should be able to find what you're looking for. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for giving up an hour of your time um, to be on today. It's really just been a joy talking with you. So appreciate your ministry. Um, and for those of you who are watching, thank you for investing an hour of your time today to really dive deep into what we need to do to make sure that our children are speaking truth in their hearts. So grateful for you, praying that God would continue to bless you as you faithfully disciple the children that he's placed in your care. We'll see you next time.